Okay, so this class is all about anatomy, that is the structure and blood supply of the bone. So you may be wondering why this class was not taken earlier, isn't it? Because the easier anatomy you have already done, okay? This was just a revision for you. So this, there's no necessity to, to go through the names of all the bones by the teacher and things like that. You can revise that on your own. But this is slightly more important. And this is related to the fracture healing. So before fracture healing class, this is highly advisable to know which are the types of bone according to the structure or histology and how our bones are getting blood supply. So this class is all about that. So let's move on. Now see here. Okay. Let me. Okay. Now, bones may be classified into four types on the basis of their shape. That is long bone, short bone, flat bone, and irregular bone. Okay. Every student know that. Long bone, short bone, flat bone, and irregular bone. Can you give me the example of long bones? Femur, radius, femur, femur, tibia, tibia, fibula, tibia, exactly. radius. Exactly. All those answers are absolutely correct. You can take any names of the long bones, okay? Femur, humerus, tibia, fibula, radius, ulna, all those, all those bones, long bone. What are the examples of flat bones? Flat. Skull. Scapula. Scapula. Skull skull. Bone, scapula. Skull. Ribs. 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 Sternum. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So be ready with this type of easy question. Sometimes we love to ask these easy questions also. So flat bones, which look flat in the shape. Okay. Like ribs, skull bones, okay? pelvic bones. Okay. Isn't it? So these are the different example for you. Sternum is also a flat bone. Absolutely. Irregular. Give me a few examples now. Facial bones. Vertebra. Vertebra. Facial bones. Facial bones. Excellent. Facial bones. Yeah. And vertebra. Vertebra are the perfect example. Every student can remember that. Vertebra. They are irregular bone. And even the facial bone, they have different shape. So these are called irregular. Very nice. So let's move on now. So if a, a typical long bone, okay, if we talk about the structure of a typical long bone in children, now what are the important term there? Now let me explain this with the help of a diagram. See here. So this is a typical long bone. Okay. You see here. Okay. This is femur. It looks like femur. The shape looks like femur, isn't it? So it has got two ends which are called epiphysis. So the lower end is also known as epiphysis. The upper end is also known as epiphysis. And the middle part, the shaft is called diaphysis. The shaft is diaphysis. So epiphysis and diaphysis. Now there is another uh, term called metaphysis also. This metaphysis is present in between epiphysis and diaphysis. So for example, up to here is the shaft of the femur Okay, and this is the epiphysis. So small area which is lying between diaphysis and epiphysis is the metaphysis. So it is present on both end. So we have known three important term now: epiphysis, diaphysis, and metaphysis. Now let's move on. Okay, right. Okay, now let's continue. Another important point you need to know is what do you mean by epiphyseal plate of cartilage or simply epiphyseal plate? Now look at this picture here. So this is epiphysis, we all can see. Okay, this is metaphysis, this is diaphysis, this is diaphysis. See here. So this is epiphysis, okay? This is also epiphysis because these are the two ends of the bone in a child, epiphysis and epiphysis. Now this main shaft is called diaphysis. So the 
the middle area between epiphysis and diaphysis is the metaphysis right here this metaphysis is considered the growing part of the bone this is considered a growing part of the bone and in between this metaphysis and epiphysis there is a small cartilage plate which is called epiphyseal plate of cartilage or you can simple simply call it epiphyseal plate as well this is apophysis we'll talk about this later this apophysis is a type of epiphysis but it doesn't contribute on the lengthening of the bone it doesn't contribute uh, for the lengthening of this femur okay it will develop into greater trochanter this is area for greater trochanter this area for lesser trochanter we all know that so this type of epiphysis are called apophysis okay now after certain years the bone growth is seized or is blocked or is inhibited because this epiphyseal plate is replaced by the bone and after that there is no lengthening of the bone this is called fusion of the epiphyseal plate on epiphysis this is important knowledge okay now let's move on let's talk about some other related anatomy now see here the articular ends of the epiphysis are covered with articular cartilage already talked about okay articular cartilage article articular means a joint okay so these articular cartilages play important role in the formation of joint now now the bone is covered from outside by periosteum by periosteum this is the outermost covering of the bone and on the inner side of the bone okay there is endosteum okay periosteum is outer part endosteum is the inner one the layer okay the middle part is called okay compact bone okay this is called compact bone now this is the main part of the bone because of this middle part or the compact bone the bone is strong these are important point so periosteum endosteum the inner part is called medullary cavity we'll talk about that a bit later medullary cavity is the inner one where there is a, you know bone marrow okay and there are lots of blood vessels running in in the medullary cavity now the periosteum is highly sensitive structure it's a highly sensitive structure it has many nerves in it it also has a lot of blood vessels and if this periosteum is stripped from the main bone it will cause severe pain it will cause severe pain i want to immediately okay give you some more knowledge here listen carefully let me use some box to to highlight it in case of fracture okay in case of fracture the pain occurs because of the damage of this periosteum this is the most important cause of pain even endosteum has got pain receptors but periosteum has many in comparison to the endosteum so in fracture pain occurs because of damage of the periosteum pain occurs due to due to periosteal damage rupture of periosteum okay another important point you have heard about a disease known as aplastic anemia okay aplastic anemia or leukemia aplastic anemia or leukemia in both these conditions there is decreased platelet count okay in these conditions there may be bony pain especially in leukemia the bony pain is much more common than aplastic anemia but why the bony pain occurs in leukemia now the reason is there is bleeding okay there is bleeding occurring below the periosteum bleeding occurs below the periosteum as a result of this this periosteum is elevated okay it is elevated from the bone from the bone or you can say it is getting stripped of the bone and that will cause severe pain in case of leukemia so 
these are some of the important you know clinical correlation of periosteum now periosteum provides attachment to the tendon muscles and ligament because it is the outermost part very easy to understand another important structure there are the strands of fibrous tissue which connect the bone to the periosteum and these are called sarpes fiber now you can clearly see here okay this structure are sarpes fiber or perforating fiber now this is the nutrient artery which will we will talk later on when i reach the blood supply of the bone now one important point here you can clearly see this is yellow bone marrow okay so yellow bone marrow means fat that medullary cavity is filled with fat and proper bone marrow the proper bone marrow is called red bone marrow now, that red bone marrow is mainly present on the ends of the bone okay on the ends of the bone means those epiphyseal area which we have just seen uh, near that area a lot of bone marrow is present okay because a spongy bone is present it at the end of the bone and very compact bone is present in the middle part okay so these are some of the important point let's move on now another point point okay now see here now let's take a cross section of the bone okay let's cut the bone and then analyze what are the structure inside microscopically bone can be microscopically the bone can be classified as either the oven bone or lamellar bone now oven bone or lamellar bone so let's analyze what do you mean by these the oven bone or immature bone it is also called immature bone is characterized by the random arrangement of the bone cells which are called osteoblast or osteocyte osteoblast means immature bone forming cell osteocytes are mature one and along with the cells there are collagen fibers also okay the collagen fibers so osteocyte along with collagen fiber if they are randomly arranged we call that oven bone or immature bone now where are they present that is another important point this oven bone is formed or present during the periods of rapid bone formation okay like in children or in the initial stages of fracture healing this oven bones are usually present there now another type of bone is lamellar bone also known as mature type of bone it has an orderly arrangement of the bone cells and the collagen fiber now remember the constituents are same in oven bone also they are present but they are randomly ordered probably uh, they take a bit of more time for the orderly arrangement and forms the lamellar bone this is the point okay so lamellar bone is present in all bones both in cortical and cancellous bone now cortical bone is a compact bone it's a hard type of bone compact bone which is mainly present on the shaft of the bone and cancellous bone is also known as spongy bone which is mainly present towards the end of the bone remember this very very important point okay we are talking about the long bone now so cortical bone is mainly present on the shaft because that is the strongest part of the bone and near to the end of the bone which are spongy type of bone they are also known as cancellous bone both are lamellar type or mature bone now the difference is in cortical bone the lamella are densely packed and in cancellous bones they are loosely packed but both of them are lamellar bone one is densely packed that's why more stronger another are loosely packed that's why they are weaker look at this uh, picture before we move further see here okay look at this end of the bone here now this bone okay this bone is called spongy bone or cancellous bone 
is bony is spongy or cancellous whereas this shaft when i come to the shaft this is called compact or cortical bone which is relatively harder and at the center there is medullary cavity which is filled by marrow the outermost covering is called periosteum okay and this is epiphyseal plate which they have shown in the picture let's move further now let's talk about okay some other structures which we see when we cut a bone the basic structural unit of a lamellar bone lamellar bone is called mature bone now okay now from now onwards don't get confused here it's a mature type of bone now the basic structural unit of a mature or lamellar bone is called osteon osteon now if we analyze this osteon now it consists of a series of concentric lamellae surrounding a central canal which is called haversian canal the in the picture it will be very clear let me go through this first so there are concentric lamella surrounding a central canal which is called haversian canal now there are so many different you know uh, uh, these lamella or different osteon inside the bone okay osteons these are the basic structural unit now let me compare this with liver histology of liver if we uh, take a you know histology of the liver or examine the histology of the liver isn't it the uh, uh, cells are called hepatocyte isn't it hepatocyte but the structural unit is probably called the portal triad right so that is the important point at the center okay there is a vein or at, at the end there is the portal tract so that area is the basic structural unit for liver the same type of comparison i can do inside the bone okay so this is osteon and there are multiple osteon inside the bone now this haversian canal okay these run longitudinally and connect freely with each other with volkmann's canal now, there are so many haversian canal inside a bone because there are multiple osteon and each of these Okay, connect freely with each other through Volkmann's canal. The later or uh, this Volkmann's canal, they run horizontally from endosteal to the periosteal surface of the bone. So these are horizontal, and these uh, haversian canals are longitudinal. So this is important point. Every student know by now the shaft of the bone is the compact bone or a stronger bone, which is called cortical bone. and the end okay they are weaker type of bone which are known as spongy bone or cancellous bone that's why there is a high chance of fracture at the junction of cortico cancellous junction now look at this picture all of you please pay attention to this picture here this is a shaft of the bone this is the end of the bone this is cortical bone which is stronger this is spongy bone which is weaker this is a junction so this junction is relatively weak so there is a high chance of fracture at this junction this is called cortico cancellous junction okay let's move to the another slide now see here what we are talking till now okay have a look at this picture all of you please pay attention on your screen so these are called lamellae okay these are the different lamellae now individual uh, you know structure or basic structure is called osteon this is osteon inside a bone there are so many different osteons okay. now see here this is one osteon this is another one this is another one and this is another one so many different osteons are there now the central a uh, canal okay at the center of the osteon is called haversian canal this is haversian canal see here this is haversian canal you can also see it here okay now these haversian canals are connected with each other through volkmann's canal okay they are connected with each other through volkmann's canal and in these haversian canals and volkmann's canal we can see blood vessels and the nerves 
which are passing through. So this is a spongy bone. Okay, this is spongy bone which is shown. A spongy bone is called weaker bone or cancellous bone, and this is compact bone. Okay, this is compact bone. Now a basic difference is both of them has the similar type of structure, but in compact bone they are orderly placed, and in spongy bone they are haphazardly placed. That's it. Now see here, the outer covering is called periosteum. This, these are a lot of osteocytes. Okay, lacuna means empty structure or empty space. And these are blood vessels and the nerves. Now another picture is showing us the same thing. See here, this is Habersian canal at the center. Okay, this is an osteon. Habersian canal at the center and osteon. This is the osteon. There are multiple osteon inside a single bone. The center canal is called Habersian canal of the osteon. In that Habersian canal, there are blood vessels and nerves. Habersian canals are connected with each other through Volkmann's canal. Okay, so this is the cancellous bone and this is cortical bone. Look at the structure. It is very compact type of bone. Cancellous bone is a spongy bone. These are different osteocytes or the bone forming cells. Okay, extracellular matrix means connective tissue substance, which is very much essential in the bone formation. So this is the a long bone. Uh, periosteum is the outer structure. In endosteum is the inner one. Medullary cavity is at the center. You can see different blood vessels there and bone marrow as well. The end of the bone is a spongy or cancellous bone, and the middle part is compact or cortical bone. Let's move on. So this is another picture. Okay. So that right in the class, the concept is very clear to the students. So let me show you once again, because the internet issue many of the students probably have missed before. So this is the time to focus. This is the proximal epiphysis. The middle part is diaphysis and the distal, okay? And the distal epiphysis, this is also epiphysis because it is lower side, we call it distal. This is the meaning. Medullary cavity, so this is the cavity at the center of the bone. It is filled with bone marrow. The yellow bone marrow is called fat. Okay, the compact bone is present mainly at the shaft. The spongy bone is mainly present toward the end. So these are the things which we have discussed till now. So if we take a cross section of this, we can clearly see, okay, uh, osteon, which is a basic structure, okay, a functional unit of the bone. Okay? Osteon, at the center of the osteon, there is Habersian canal. Volkmann's canal means there are a connection between different Habersian canal. Habersian canal long, lo, run longitudinally, but Volkmann's canal run horizontally. And they contain blood vessels and nerves inside them. Okay. Sarpy's fiber means there's a connection between shaft of the bone or compact bone and periosteum. So these are the points we have talked till now. Okay, now I'll give you one minute time so that every student please focus on your screen and revise yourself. Please have a look there. Okay, now see here. Okay, so before moving further, let me highlight once again epiphysis. Okay, now another proximal epiphysis is not shown here. This is the diaphysis, okay, a shaft of the bone. Diaphysis is made up of compact bone 
or cortical bone, which is the strongest one. And the end of the bone or epiphysis are mainly made up of spongy or cancellous bone. So these are important points. Now, if I go towards the medullary cavity, again, it is comprises of cancellous bone because only the shaft, only the main part of the bone, okay, of this area is a compact bone. The spongy bone can clearly see here. The structure is different. They are haphazardly placed and they are really compact. This is osteon with a central canal or haversian canal, periosteum, okay, and these are the different osteocytes with lacuna means empty space. Now, let's move further. So the bone is made up of bone cells and extracellular matrix. Now bone cells and extracellular matrix. The matrix consists of two types of material, which are organic and inorganic. Organic and inorganic. Now let's analyze them. What do you mean by that? The organic matrix, okay, is formed by the collagen tissue or the collagen fiber, which forms around 30 to 35 percent of dry weight of the bone. So only 30 to 35 percent of the dry weight of the bone is formed by collagen okay this collagen is a fiber just like elastic fiber it's like reticulin fiber this collagen is a type of fiber and this fiber is responsible for one of the strength of the bone not whole strength but one of the component of the strength is by collagen fiber now the inorganic component or inorganic matrix is primarily formed by calcium and phosphorus salt okay and they form a hydroxyapatite crystals. Hydroxyapatite crystal. And this is the chemical formula of that hydroxyapatite crystal. You don't need to know this much, okay? But look at the component of this. We have calcium there and we have phosphate there, okay? This is hydroxide. So calcium and phosphate along with hydroxide, okay? In a different proportion will make hydroxyapatite crystal. This hydroxyapatite crystal constitute about 65 to 70 percent of dry weight of a bone. Now, a one point you need to understand from this slide is bone is mainly formed by collagen or calcium and phosphorus in the form of hydroxyapatite crystals. So if any one of them is decreased, in the bone the bone will become weaker there's no doubt about it you remember the topic of pathological fracture which we discussed before this class the different conditions we talk there like osteoporosis okay osteomalacia rickets renal osteodystrophy so many different conditions we talk now all of those conditions can either decrease the collagen inside the bone okay or they decrease the calcium and phosphate salt or in the form of hydroxyapatite crystal inside the bone. Okay, so this is the meaning. Now, what are the types of bone cells that are present inside the bone? Every student knows this. Now, please see here, take a bit of time and see there, please. Now, there are three main cells inside the bone. These are called osteoblast, osteocyte, and osteoclast. Osteoblast, osteocytes, and osteoclast. Osteoblast, okay, they are bone forming cells. They are bone forming cells, so they are concerned with ossification. And they are very rich in alkaline phosphatase enzyme. Never forget this golden statement. They are rich in alkaline phosphatase enzyme. Now, can you tell me which are the other sources of alkaline phosphatase? Liver, liver cells. Liver cells. Liver cells. Good. Any other? Placenta. Good. Placenta. Yes. Yes. Placenta. Wonderful. Okay. Now, 
I want to give, immediately take you to this, uh, you know, discussion. The sources of alkaline phosphatase in our body is remembered by the, uh, you know, a mnemonic blip, B L I P blip. Okay. Let me talk about the full form of this blip now. B stands for bone. Okay. L stands for liver. L stands for liver. I stands for intestine. Intestine, you can say. And P stands for placenta. So these are the common sources of alkaline phosphatase. Now, if a growing child comes to us, okay, growing child comes to us, and if you do liver function test, now naturally the alkaline phosphatase level would be higher in that growing child. That doesn't mean that child is having liver disease. Probably the source of alkaline phosphatase in that child is from the bone because the bones are growing there and there are activation of osteoblast inside the bone in that child. So this type of knowledge you should have quickly. Now other types of enzymes are glycolytic enzyme and phosphorylase, okay? It is necessary for the nutritional purpose of the bone. Glycolysis, okay? And phosphorylase is important, okay? In case of glycogenolysis, glycogenolysis. So th these are, are important for the nutritional purpose of the bone. Osteocyte are known as mature bone cell. The same osteoblast will develop into osteocyte, okay? So their functions are similar. One is mature, another is immature. That's it. These osteocytes are rich in glycogen and they have PAS positive granules. This is per iodic acid sieve. Okay, so let me write that. Many students would, would be confused. This is a type of stain actually. Per iodic acid, okay, sieve stain. S C H I F F. Okay, per iodic acid sieve. This is called PAS positive granules. Actually, they are glycosin itself. Now the third type of uh, uh, cell which are very so right now we are talking about what are the types of bone cells okay present inside the bone so there are uh, three main uh, types of the bone cell osteoblast and osteocyte we already talked now we are talking what is osteoclast okay now can anybody tell me what type of cell is osteoclast from where it is developed it's from monocyte it's a microphage. Monocyte. Microphage of the bone. Bone resorbing cell. Good. So all the answers are correct. It is bone resorbing cell and it is a type of macrophage and it is developed from monocyte. Absolutely. Okay. Remember, it's a type of macrophage which is present inside the bone. So the main function of this is resorption of the bone. In other words, it eats the bone away. And as a result of that, there is increased amount of calcium in the blood. Whenever osteoclast activity is increased, there is increased calcium in the blood because it is dissolving calcium from the bone into the blood. And how it is doing that? It has got certain enzyme. With the help of those enzyme, okay, it is dissolving the bone. And these enzymes are hydrolases enzyme collagenases and acid phosphatases. So these are the important point. Now, uh, let's move further. Let's talk about some other uh, new information. How a growth of a long bone occur? Let's talk about this. Let's see here. All long bone, with the exception of the clavicle, developed from cartilaginous primordia that is called inchondral ossification, or you can also call it endochondral ossification. So what does that mean? In the beginning, there is a framework of cartilage form, and inside that cartilage, the ossification occur, and it will convert into the bone. That is the meaning of endochondral ossification. 
another is called membrane ossification okay there is no formation of the cartilage in membrane ossification now this type of ossification starts okay in the middle of the shaft which is called primary center of ossification and it is already there before the birth the primary center of ossifications are already developed before birth and these are mainly present in the middle of the shaft the secondary ossification center which are in the epiphysis means toward the end of the bone they appear okay at the end of the bone because they are epiphysis and they mostly occur after the birth so one important point you need to understand here is uh, these epiphy uh, sorry uh, ossification centers primary and secondary primary is present in the diaphysis or middle of the shaft which is already there before birth and uh, the secondary ossification center are present in epiphysis and they are mostly developed after the birth now the bone growth in length okay occurs by a continuous growth at the epiphyseal plate okay. now if we uh, analyze the different parts of the young bone okay you already know the ends are epiphysis middle is diaphysis okay there is metaphysis and in between the metaphysis and epiphysis there is epiphyseal plate of the cartilage so that is the place where bone continuously grow but the girth of the bone girth means the width or the breadth of the bone is increased by subperiosteal new bone deposition quite naturally because this is all about the width of the bone okay so let's move further now at the end of the growth period when that uh, you know uh, child becomes adult now the epiphysis fuses with the diaphysis and after that the growth of the bone stops so it depends on which bone we are talking about okay so different bones uh, stop growing at a different age so this is the important question which your teacher would love to ask you now the parents also ask you the same question till what age my son or my daughter grow doctor he is just this much tall can he become taller even even more something like that okay so you should answer in a in a in a clever way and say uh, a bit of growth may happen okay but the major uh, majority of the growth has already occurred in your kid once they come at the age of puberty because that is the uh, you know age where rapid bone growth occurs now let's talk about the secondary centers of ossification here the secondary centers of ossifications are the epiphysis okay epiphysis so they do not contribute to the length of the bone sometimes and they are known as apophysis apophysis in the beginning of the class also we talked about this apophysis are the type of epiphysis which do not contribute to the length of the bone a good example we can give is greater trochanter of the femur okay so it doesn't contribute to the length of the femur at all it is there just to attach for the muscle the time and sequence of the appearance and fusion of epiphysis has got clinical relevance in deciding the true age which is called bone age of a child now at what age it it appear and what age it got fused with the main bone it is a uh, altogether a different type of you know education or knowledge this is called bone age which is a part of forensic medicine for example you know a person was uh, dead okay a child is dead let's talk like that and by studying different uh, different bone of that child okay uh, the forensic expert uh, can guess what is the age of that child okay so this is called studying of the bone age this can also be done with the help x ray or radiography sometime an epiphyseal plate may be wrongly interpreted as a fracture this is what commonly done by the medical student who had just started looking at the x ray of the bone in especially in the child because uh, the cartilage which is present near uh, between the metaphysis and epiphysis okay these cartilages cannot be seen on x ray so this area okay is looking like a fracture line 
but please be careful here okay so this is not a fracture this is just a normal structure the cartilage which is not seen on the x-ray now if there are no history of trauma or nothing this is not a case of fracture at all but sometimes that cartilage can also get fractured that is altogether another thing okay so uh, this is an important point now let's talk about remodeling of the bone so what do you mean by this now bone has the ability to alter its size shape and structure in response to the stress now let me highlight a little bit more here okay see here bone has the ability to alter its size its shape and its structure in response to the stress now that means if we constantly stimulate the bone if we constantly stimulate the bone the bone may become slightly longer okay and slightly change its structure as well this is called ulf's law of bone remodeling and according to this ulf's law of bone remodeling bone hypertrophy occurs in the plane of stress there is increase in the bone girth or the width in case of stress means if we constantly give some stimulation to the bone this can happen and let me tell you one more knowledge here let me share actually uh, in case of non union okay non union of the bone there are some special type of surgery or some special type of stimulation to the bone so that there is a chance of regrowth of the bone again so this is a important principle now we have come towards the end part of this small topic now at the end let's talk about what is the blood supply of the bone from where bone gets its blood supply now the main arteries which supply uh, this bone okay you may be wondering from where these arteries come now these arteries are the branches of a big artery which is running on the side is running on the side for example if we talk about femur the femoral artery runs right from from the side of femur so that femoral artery will give rise to all these different arteries if we talk about humerus the brachial arteries is right there okay so these all are branches of the major artery which is running on the side now that is one part now another one which are those specific arteries that supply the bone so one of the main is called nutrient artery nutrient artery you can clearly see on the picture there so let me highlight and show you see here this is the nutrient blood vessels uh, there are okay arteries and veins so right now we are mainly concerned about the arterial supply so this is the nutrient artery this nutrient artery after entering uh, into the medullary cavity of the bone there is a small foramina okay called nutrient foramen in the bone through that nutrient foramen it will enter inside and after reaching the middle part of the shaft of the bone in the medullary cavity it will bifurcate into two branches one is going up this is a ascending branch and another is going down which is a descending one so this is called nutrient blood vessel now, another are metaphyseal blood vessels see there this area is metaphyses so these are metaphyseal blood vessels this is epiphysis so these are epiphysial blood vessels okay and some more are periosteal blood vessels which are coming from outside periosteal so all these blood vessels will form a good anastomosis inside the bone or on the surface and this anastomosis is responsible for a good blood supply of the bone now with this knowledge let's move further and let's analyze this so nutrient artery this vessel enters the bone around its middle okay it enters into the bone around its middle through the nutrient foramen and divides into two branches one running towards either end of the bone so ascending and the descending 
each of these further divide into a list of parallel vessel which run toward the respective metaphysis. They run toward the metaphysis and then the anastomose there, okay, forming a plexus. Okay, so let's move further. Now, let's talk about these branches now. Metaphysial vessels, you can see right here, these are called metaphysial vessel and they form anastomosis around the joint, especially, okay? This is the area where joint is formed because this is the end of the bone, right? So uh, they form anastomosis around the joint and they supply the joint as well. These are metaphysial blood vessels. Now one very important uh, clinical, uh, you know, correlation, I like to share right here okay. is, let me explain it here. In case of osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis, this is the infection of the bone. One of the most common site for the osteomyelitis development is the lower end of the femur and upper end of the tibia. Now, that area is in the metaphysis of the bone. Osteomyelitis is very common in children and it occurs in the metaphysial area of the growing bone. And those two important bones, okay, it may occur in any bone actually, but the most common bones are upper end of the tibia and lower end of the femur. Now, you may be wondering why it is common there. These metaphysial blood vessels, okay, they have a special type of arrangement there. They form a hairpin bend, okay? They form a loop there, hairpin bend. Means those blood vessels are bending there acutely. And there is a chance of stasis of blood for a short duration there. Now, think of a situation. If that blood is carrying some bacteria, like Staphylococcus aureus, because of that hairpin bend arrangement, those bacteria can lodge there and multiply, leading to osteomyelitis. So this occurs in metaphysis area of the growing bone, especially a femur and tibia. Okay. Now let's move further. Let's talk about uh, some other types of blood vessels. Epiphyseal vessel, these are vessels which enter directly into the epiphysis from the nearby blood vessels again. And other are periosteal. The periosteal blood vessels are also important. The periosteum has a very rich blood supply. We already know about this, from which many little blood vessels they enter the bone. Okay, many little blood vessels they enter the bone, and then the outer part of the bone is supplied by these periosteal blood vessels. Now, here, these little vessels they enter the bone to supply roughly the outer third of the cortex of the adult bone. What about the inner two thirds of the bone now? This is outer one third, but inner two third is still left, isn't it? So the inner two thirds of the shaft of the bone is supplied by the nutrient artery, which we already talked. And only the outer one third is done by periosteal blood vessels. Some of the important clinical correlation quickly here. If periosteum is stripped or elevated from the surface of the bone, what will happen to the bone now? Yes, what will happen to that bone? The supply will decrease. The bone will dislocate. The, the outer third of the compromise the surprise. Exactly. The blood supply. Exactly. Blood supply will the blood supply to the outer one third will be compromised, isn't it? This is what we, we just learned. The blood supply to the outer third of the surface of the bone is compromised and there may be ischemia, there may be necrosis of the bone and uh, that bone will take a long, long time to heal or never get healed as well. It depends on how bad is the uh, blood supply there. So these are the important information which you immediately know from the blood supply. 
sometimes there is a, a embolus which passes into the nutrient blood vessels. So probably the inner part of the bone gets suffered there. But the, the end of the bone may not suffer still because there are lots of anastomosis going on toward the end of the bone. 